So it's a nice stretching routine here. I think a lot of stretching routines don't really work and don't focus on good stuff. And a lot of them do work, but take a ton of time. So we're gonna just try to compromise in between, just get to the good stuff quickly, get it done, be out, move on to the good training. So we're just gonna be going through static stretches. Contrary to sort of the popular belief lately, static stretches are actually really good. There's some meta reviews, I believe from 2018, looking at all the different types of stretches. Sort of collecting as, as many studies as they could on all these different types of stretches over 12 weeks and see you know who makes the most progress in what areas but actually as, as much as people have been hating on the static stretching they did the best i am a believer in the idea of flexibility and mobility to an extent where flexibility is what your end range is and mobility is more what your end range is and, and what your control is over the entire range. But I've found working with clients and students over the years that the people that are more flexible, it's much easier to build the strength through the whole range. And they generally have much more access to that range than the people that are tighter, but more strong. So we're gonna work on kind of developing that range faster. And then you can always think about building the strength in that range more. So in this meta review, what they found was they stratified it into three groups. So less than five minutes per muscle group per week, five to 10 minutes per muscle group per week, or more than 10 minutes per muscle group per week. Basically the five to 10 minute group essentially did the best. 10 minutes or more didn't seem to make a difference. We're gonna stay at the end range of that 10 minutes just to be safe and so we're, we're we're making really good progress but we're also not you know wasting any time first one we're go, gonna go for is just a basic middle slip here we're gonna actually push the hips back behind the feet i was always taught that for all this stuff that we won't put the hands on the floor that we want to do this with a full load uh the whole time and really only go to the, the range that you have the strength in. But the more I, I learn over the years, uh, the more I think there are times where it can be very useful to put the hands on the floor and then decrease the load. And so this is actually something lately that I like to do. So we'll be here and um, we're gonna go for 90 seconds here. We can start nice and light. And what we'll do is we'll just take a metronome here. And so we'll set it. So what I like to do for this is we'll go in these five second phases. So we have the timer set for 90 seconds and we'll go in these four or five second phases and sort of cycle them. So the first five seconds, we'll just sort of inhale, relax, get adjusted to the position. Next five seconds, we'll exhale, sink deeper into the position. Next five seconds, we'll contract the stretched muscles. So we can pull here, we're pulling, pulling the feet together as much as we can. And the next five seconds, we'll pull the feet apart, pulling out from the stretch. And we'll just repeat again. And exhale deeper in the stretch. Contract, stretch muscles. And pull the feet apart. Okay, from here, something I really like incorporating. Now, this is a little challenging for people, but I found it to be really helpful. So again, we, we want this compromise between doing good things and, and making progress with what we're doing, but also being effective with how much time we're spending to do it. One of the nice tricks here is just after each stretch, if we go into an inversion and we actively work the, the counter part of that stretch. Um, it can be really nice, again, sort of building some strength in that end range, but also just kind of opening up and, and working just a little bit of that flexibility mobility. It is hard for people, but if you have a headstand, this is a wonderful option you can do. So we can come up here 
and put the knees on the elbows. And if we're reasonably good here, we can come up just into a headstand, inverted version of the middle split. What I like to do is just pull the legs apart. And we'll do this for 10 seconds in the end range. And so what I like to do, so here I'll just, just bring your legs a little higher. And so it's a little more, yeah, like a middle split. And then just pull them as wide as you can. There we go. Excellent. Okay, the next one we'll go into is the pancake. So again, each of these stretches, we're trying to get a lot of different things done uh, and useful things. So we could go through one body part at a time and do a whole hour-long stretching routine, and that'd be nice. But um, we've got better things to do, okay? So we're just going to go through, through a few of the most effective stretches. Uh, and these are definitely it, and the pancake is most certainly one of them. So essentially, we're just going to spread the legs out here. Wider is not necessarily better. You don't have to spread the legs as far as you possibly can. But they should be reasonably near it. And then from here, we're going to try to sit on the front, the ischium here, the, the sit bones. So you can kind of feel that part of your hip making contact with the floor. Basically not, not being here, but being here. And that gets, gets us to a good spot. We have 90 seconds. And we're going to work our way forward the same way. So we go inhale. Exhale forward. Contract, and contract into the stretch. Exhale, contract, and contract. Now, same thing, working that inversion. So we'll work the pancake in the headstand. So it'll be a little different than the middle split. So the middle split inverted, we're just gonna keep the legs reasonably aligned over the torso, and then we're just gonna abduct the hips, right? We're just gonna spread the legs apart. Here, we can let the, the legs come forward, right? So if the middle split was more here, the pancake, we can come more here. And again, we'll hold 10 seconds. If you get a cramp, that's okay. It's a good thing, actually. Nice, right? Small tip for the headstand, so this is something that is, is a really cool trick you can do, but you kind of need some sort of inversion to do it, right? So, so handstand is really nice, that's really hard for a lot of people, but it's just a hard thing to do. Headstand is a lot easier, but still it's maybe a little out of reach for a lot of people at the beginning, but just with a little practice, a little bit of technique. You know, anyone can get the headstand without too much trouble. So just one, one quick and easy tip for the headstand. You always want to make sure that your head is reasonably forward of your hands. Right? So we have a, a base of support here between 
all eye contacts on the floor. So in the headstand, it's my two hands and the head. And the thing is, I have to balance between this area. And so if my head is between the hands here, now the area I have to balance in is much less. And so it can be a lot harder to balance there. Yet, a lot of people do this. It's a very common mistake that people will put the head right between the hands and they'll try to do the headstand here. So um, just the way you were doing it just now, right? If you bring the head a little farther forward, it should be a little easier. You have a little more balance. Okay? You try it again. Just a nice triangle there. There we go. Take your time. Keep going, all right, keep going, 10 seconds. I keep both sides even. Yeah, good, good. Struggling with the mouse a little, but you got it, nice. Next, I'm gonna go into the front splits. Front splits are another really wonderful stretch. We're getting a lot of things at the same time, so we're gonna do it. And the thing, with the front splits, with the middle splits, it, it never has to be a split, right? Anyone can do it. It's, you know, if you're 80 years old, this might be, <laughs> maybe this is your front split. And that's, that's fine to start, right? But as you work, it will go lower and lower, right? And the same thing with the middle split. Your middle split, I have a lot of clients that they start their middle split is, is literally, you know, something about here, right? And that's fine. It's just, it's just, we can still do everything exactly the same. You just have more uh, room for improvement, right? So with the front split, it's a front split, but you know, no need to be intimidated. It doesn't have to be hips to the floor, right? So we'll go left leg forward first, and we're gonna do the same sort of cycle. So big inhale. Exhale, I'm gonna start to slide forward. Want to make sure the back foot doesn't rotate too much. We want it sort of behind that knee as much as we can get. Nice. Working our way forward. Contractions. And contract the other way. And next one. Inhale. And exhale. Slide into the stretch. Contract down into the floor. And contract. Pull your hips down. Two more. If we need to put our hands on the floor here, that's fine but we'll just make sure not to do it on one side or the other and kind of get a lopsided stretch or not really be doing a front split. Just make sure the hands are on both sides. Contraction, so this hip opening, this leg pulling down, same time. So it's going to be just like the front split, right? We've got one leg that's, that's here and one leg that's over the top here. If this leg is straight, then we're not getting the full stretch that we want in the hip flexors and uh, in the quad. So we're gonna bend that knee as well. This is something that comes up often. Don't keep that leg straight. Bend this knee, open that hip as much as you can, and pull this leg down and straighten this leg as much as you can. Take your time, take your time, take your time. And you can bend this leg. And straighten the other one. Good. Good. Nice. 
Nice, nice, nice. Okay, we'll do the other side. Right leg forward. Ninety seconds again. Here we go. Exhale and stretch. Contract. Pulling the front foot down. The back knee into the floor. Pulling into the floor. Maybe even pushing the foot. Now for the other contraction, we're pulling this leg up and opening this hip back. Exhale. One thing to watch out for is a lot of times your leg wants to slide out to the side. And if that happens, then you just pull it back. Get it as straight as you can. Yeah, your legs and hips want to slide to an easier position, so you just pull them to where we want the stretch to be. We want it to be a straight front split. We don't want it to be some sort of weird front split, middle split hybrid here. Yeah? So as best as you can, try to keep your hips facing towards the front leg. here. I'm going to straighten this leg. I can even dorsiflex this foot. I'm going to open this knee. Again, this leg isn't straight. It's bent here. Maximal contraction and range for 10 seconds. And we can come back down. Nice. The last one we're going to do is just uh, some bridge push-ups. So this one, very common, lots of people do it in yoga, but also very easy to make some mistakes here where it happens all the time. The temptation is in the bridge that you want to go towards your feet this way. And now there are two problems with that. So again, your body can handle any position that you put it in that you get it to adapt to. Right? It gets stronger anywhere you put it. It responds to any stimulus you give it. However, if you haven't given those stimulus yet, or it's a new stimulus, sometimes we want to take it easier. And then maybe even in something like this where the load is lower, maybe we pay attention to some details here. And so what happens all the time is people will tell me, they'll, they'll go here in the bridge, they'll tell me, they'll come down and they'll say, ah, oh, oh, my wrist hurting from the bridge. This shouldn't happen. This should not happen if, you're, if your wrists are so weak that even loading them here in like a sort of kneeling push-up position, if this hurts, then yes, the bridge push-up is probably gonna hurt your wrists as well until you make them stronger, until you get them to adapt. But uh, almost everyone, this is fine, right? If you don't have a wrist injury, this is fine. And then if you go in the bridge push-up, and your wrist hurt after, it's, it's essentially because you've made this mistake here. So, for that main reason, you want to pay attention to the elbow position. So if my elbows come forward here, the wrist angle becomes harder, becomes more demanding, let's say, right? My elbows go here, you see the angle of my wrist changes, and this gets more demanding on the wrist. You guys can try this and you'll see. It feels much harder on the wrist. So I want to keep the elbows almost stacked over my hands, or ideally even try to push them this way as I come up, okay? The reason people don't do this is because it does make the bridge harder at the beginning, but it is worth it because here's the thing, no matter what, when you get good at the bridge, you can't be here. This is never gonna be a good bridge even if I lock the elbows here. To be a good bridge, you have to start getting your shoulders more and more over your hands. You're gonna have to do that anyway. And that's also how the bridge is gonna open up your shoulders, which is one of the reasons we're doing this in the first place. So just as you're doing this, make sure you're, you're keeping the elbows stacked over the wrist, 
or even pushing them forward. And so at the beginning, you don't have to go here, then you're not going to be able to go anywhere. But don't let the elbows travel forward, okay? Just keep them there and push up from here. And as you get higher, now we can really just start pushing the shoulders back over the hands and then locking the elbows later. So we're ready, let's give this a try. Okay, great. Okay, so first, maybe you can show uh, doing it wrong. Right? So yeah, exactly. And you feel that in the wrist, right? Yeah. yeah. Again, it's not that your wrist can't handle it. They can. You can work them stronger, get them to adapt to this position. But if they're not there yet, when we want to do the bridge right now, we can do it in this, this easy position, right? And at the same time, we can also open up the shoulders. So this is a really great two for one here. So now let's do it. So, ah, hold on. Ah, good thing. So from here, I always like to sort of wiggle the hands and feet closer together. Okay, so this is a common thing. So if you just try to put both of your hands on the floor at the same time, like you just did, and like a lot of people do, try it at the same time without wiggling at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back down. Okay, now just put the hands there without bridging. Yes. So we see palms are on the floor, the hands are pretty far from the shoulders, and generally this is going to be an awkward position to try to bridge from. So from here, it's always, it's always good to try to, to wiggle here and get this set up just right. So we want to get the fingers pointing towards the shoulders, as close to the shoulders as we can. We want to get the feet close to under the hips. Depending on how flexible you are, you'll want to do more or less of that. As you get better in the bridge, your feet and hands are going to need to get really as close as possible to do a really good bridge. So here we go. Good, we're pushing up. Nice. Yeah, this is fine. So as we come down, we're taking care that the elbows don't come forward here, they're staying here and not come down. Keep your head off the floor, keep your head off the floor. Come down, head off the floor, yes. Mm. There we go. In between each rep, we're gonna get the, the shoulder blades down on the floor and even we'll get the hips as low as we can. Yeah, sometimes they'll be able to get to the floor depending on your foot position, sometimes not, that's okay. But every time we want full range of motion, so hips as low as we can, upper back on the floor. Nice and controlled. Excellent. Excellent. Very nice. And as you come down, Dad, this is this is a thing. Yeah. As you come down, the elbows start to come forward. So just keep them. They don't have to be too narrow. So you just place them again. And do your little wiggle. You find a comfortable position for the hands. Yeah. And you can wiggle. The other thing you can do is is once your hands are placed. You can also wiggle your shoulders to the hands. You don't have to wiggle the hands to the shoulders, yeah. Mm. Just get everything. Yeah, that's kind of easier, right? Yeah. There you go again. Go. Good. Push up as high as you can here. Hold half a second and then control it down. Control it down. Keep the elbows, yeah. Keep the head off the floor. Head off the floor. Head off the floor. Nice. Hips down. Go again. Good. Maybe the hands are a little narrow here, so come down again, keep the head off the floor, head off the floor, good. Better coming down this side. Nice. Yeah. And again, same thing as you come forward, keeping good elbow and wrist position. Nice. So this is our basic stretching routine. Something I do in pretty much every class I have for well over a year now. It's a great thing to do when you don't have a lot of time, but you want to get more flexible. Flexibility is helpful, but it's not going to get us good at pretty much anything we want to do other than flexibility, right? There was a really interesting point that was made by Todd Hargrove in his book, Guide to Better Movement, I believe. But it really stuck with me. It was like, it was essentially like, imagine how flexible like LeBron James is or like Tiger Woods. Some of these guys that are like really high level athletes, they're not high level athletes because they're flexible or because they're really strong for that matter. They're high level athletes because they're very skilled, right? Because they're very good at what they do. You know, in certain sports, say for, for gymnastics, it plays a bigger role than others. But again, you can do front splits and bridges and all this stuff all day. You get really good at it. That's not going to make you a good gymnast, not even close. If you're a good gymnast and you do this stuff well, it will help. But it, it, you know, there's a difference. So just remember with our stretching work, we're trying to get some good effect, but we're also not gonna spend too much time on it, right? Because we, we have important things to do. Also, it is important if you are gonna do the this, this stretching 
a little more passive like this. This was sort of in between, but just with some of the research, you do want to try to do a warm up after or do this before the warm up or do this at the end of the, the session or just something to do at night, whatever. But you don't want to go from a bunch of passive stretching straight into like hard explosive activity. So the research is saying if you go straight from one to the other, essentially your uh, power production is going to be lower and your risk of injury is going to be higher. But if you do a good warm up in between, you can neutralize those and then you're good.